Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's been a pleasure the whole week listening to everyone's talks. Um, so this is my outline of the talk. I will first go over um, deriving sterile neutrino constraints from gravitational strong lens quad systems. Um, and then I will discuss a bit about what the future will bring um, for us in this particular area. And then I will go over a couple of ongoing works um, and hopeful steps that we can um, take towards preparing for that future. So um, similar to the talk you just heard of, um, we use um, gravitational strong lensing as applied to um, quasars. Uh, and they are lensed by um, lens galaxy. Uh, and we see the images that are formed um, ba basically by the impact of the uh, distribution of the substructure in the halos of the main lens systems. Um, these are uh, examples of how the actual observations look like uh, from um, Anna Nirenberg's papers. And uh, maybe intuitively when you look at them, you may not be like, oh my God, this is going to be, you know, the precision measurement that doesn't matter. But, uh, <laughs> 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 but turns out um, it's actually really cool, um, a really cool probe to be able to infer that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, the key here is the fact that um, all, ga all galaxies form at actual nodes of uh, dark matter filaments. And um, it's also very convenient for us that different um, particles of dark matter result in different um, substructure formation at the level of um, halos and subhalos that can be probed with this technique. So um, if we have uh, our favorite uh, model of um, dark matter, um, all one has to do, um, though it may not be so direct, is um, calculate the phase, um, the phase distribution function, um, pass it into um, class, get the transfer function from there, and then uh, use the initial conditions that are basically given by um, the CMB measurements. You know, you can't really tweak that much. Um, and then uh, propagate that structure formation further to the power spectrum and calculate uh, in a linear regime the, the halo mass function, and then in the nonlinear regime the sub halo mass function. So um, this uh, all sounds good, uh, except when we think about the fact that one would have to generate this for every mass um, proposal for the given particle. Um, so if we want to compare to data, um, any sort of posterior on the mass distribution would have to technically know how the structure formation would look like through entire n-body simulations um, for each proposal of that um, um, mass. So this is why uh, n body simulations are so important in our field, and um, thank you so much for working on it. And uh, those, um, that the trick that we use is basically take the results from the n body simulations and um, interpolate the behaviors of what would be the formation, um, uh, basically the formation structure for particle masses that are sampled in between the ones that the simulations were run for. for. So um, for this uh, analysis, uh, we actually use uh, Galacticus, which is a semi-analytical code developed by Andrew Benson and his uh, research group. And um, the advantage of it is that um, being semi-analytical, it doesn't actually take as much time uh, as embody simulations, um, but it is um, using the recipes derived in embody simulations. And um, it's basically cr creating uh, merger trees and based on these merger trees, we can construct um, halo and subhalo mass functions for a given uh, dark matter model. So um, basically, this uh, step is, you know, these three steps are covered uh, by the Galacticus thing. So uh, in this particular research project, I was looking um, at the uh, KEV regimes of um, dark matter models. So these are um, uh, known as also warm dark matter. That's also uh, one of the models that is in that regime. It's also very well um, sampled by the uh, gravitational lens um, approach. So um, one uh, of such dark matter models is the sterile neutrino. 
Um, the Sierra neutrinos take their name from um, the fact that um, you know, neutrinos being uh, fermions, they have um, spins, and um, basically the uh, weak uh, force interacts only with um, left-handed um, uh, neutrinos, which are basically, uh, you know, one type of spin. So um, we believe that if there's uh, the other type of spin available as well, it may not interact with the weak force. Um, so those are called sterile by night interaction. Of course, other particles that don't interact with any force, um, even dark matter, you could call it sterile from the point of view of not interacting with said force, like ENM. Um, but in this case, it just refers to not interacting with the, with the weak force. Uh, and I looked at four different um, sterile neutrino models um, that have different uh, production mechanisms. And um, what we, what we do is, uh, this is an image from Daniel Gilman's 2020 analysis uh, that he just talked about earlier, is we try to match the photometry of the images as well as the positions for them. And the proposals sample from the, from the halo mass functions of the theoretical model that's being studied. And um, statistically, we just look over multiple realizations of each, uh, for each quad system in the, in the set. So um, this is a plot of the posterior that Daniel inferred in his paper um, for the uh, half mode mass, basically. Uh, and then here you can um, see something very clearly that like there's no um, going to zero on the left, on, on the left side. So basically this creates, um, you know, there may be dragons, as they say, uh, over there. <laughs> So we can only put a limit from this uh, analysis, not a constraint right now. Um, so what people have done through basically the same embody simulations that I described before is um, we, they have inferred relationships between what would be the thermal relic warm dark matter and the uh, half mode mass for a given uh, hill mass function. So I was using the recipes from Schneider et al. from 2012. Um, and the two curves here um, come from basically making two different assumptions about the conversion between um, the, um, the exact half mode mass in, in length and the conversion to the, to the actual mass itself that require a different assumption about the density of the universe, whether or not it includes the baryons as well. So uh, for a certain audience I was looking at, um, I think this was mentioned earlier in the, in the conference as well. There's a um, similarity in the transfer function, uh, transfer function themselves that allows a very simple mapping between uh, the different energy levels in a given sterile models and the thermal relic one dark matter. So um, this basically simplifies the analysis a lot because one does not have to run the whole pipeline again. Um, so what I did is I inferred um, a conversion relationship between the mass functions of the sterile neutrinos and the thermal relic warm dark matter, and then I transferred the posteriors that were measured um, for, the, uh, for each sterile neutrino model, obtaining um, a 95% lower limit on all of them. And uh, this is uh, also based on Simona Vegetti's work in 2018, uh, where she was constraining the Schiffer model. Um, so I basically, um, our limits are basically below the, um, the red line of seven. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's a pretty strong constraint over there. But um, these are all so far constraints from uh, strong gravitational lensing. And because this mapping was simply a mapping into the thermal relic wonder matter, there are other works that have constrained thermal relic wonder matter from other techniques in, in physics, like the galaxy satellite counts from um, Ethan's work, um, and uh, Lyman Alpha Forest as well. So I wanted to um, see if we can sort of combine this and what are the limits when one combines this together. Um, and these, are, these were the results. So um, obviously the limits are stronger when uh, all of these techniques are combined together. There is actually no uh, possibility right now to combine exactly all, uh, all four together. So like the papers are either combining strong lensing with galaxy counts or Lyman alpha for a separate. So it would be really cool to do a analysis across all three at the same time. Um, the GitHub uh, repository is available publicly. You can basically reproduce 
um, everything that was done in this analysis using it. Um, so the other part I want to talk to you about is um, what about the future? So this work I just showed uh, actually used only eight quad systems to get at the time what were the most stringent constraints on forced running three models. Um, so the nice thing is that we have um, Euclid already uh, basically coming out and giving us data and uh, LSST. And uh, there's uh, forecasting that, sh that predicts that there will be uh, 8,000 lens quads and lens quasars discovered, out of which um, 3,000 can be used for uh, measure time delay, um, related to a question that was before in the audience as well. Um, and about 1,200 would be quad systems. So we will hopefully move from eight to thousands, basically, in the span of the next five to 10 years. Um, so, so the path here is to um, basically conform the lens systems um, by determining the redshift and um, identifying that there's a foreground and a background um, galaxy involved in the system, and then uh, by measuring the spectrum of the, of the actual lens images. Uh, and then propose follow-up with the very precise, um, basically, measurements, uh, like either JWST, HST, or um, from the ground. So um, in the um, analysis of lens images from, from um, Anna Nirenberg's work, um, basically, in addition to just looking at uh, the quads themselves, um, one takes advantage of the fact that we can measure the spectra of, um, of the images themselves and separate basically the, the contributions of, between the narrow line emission and broadband emission. Um, so this plays, uh, so a big role in this play uh, adaptive optic systems that can actually um, correct the, basically the point spread function for the contribution of the atmosphere for the case of uh, the telescopes on the ground. So um, I will be talking about upcoming improvements that have to do with both um, AO um, upgrades, but also detector upgrades on this, on this side. So um, right now at the Keck telescope, um, we have the series detector and the current AO system, but we are um, uh, going to see soon the Kappa adaptive optic system installed. Um, which is being uh, basically commissioned at the end of 2024, and it's probably going to be giving uh, data in 2025. And then uh, the detector is going to be upgraded to the LIGER system. This is an improvement um, by in, in the number of pixels on the spectrograph side uh, by a factor of two uh, and the inner resolution of it as well. Uh, and this is the same detector um, instrument that's actually going to be used for the TMT. Um, it has a different name, it's called IRIS for the, for the TMT, but it's the same team developing it and it's identical. Um, and then finally, I looked at the adaptive optic systems for NFIR hours, which will also go on the TMT. So um, the very nice uh, improvements here are coming also from the readout noise um, that's and the dark current that are going low, uh, basically as the detectors are um, getting uh, better, including um, the changes in the pixel size. So. Uh, one big expectation from the adaptive optic system is that it's going to change the way that the correction for the atmosphere is, is going to be done. So um, there is a prediction that uh, basically kappa will bring the sterile ratio uh, with, from basically 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 in ideal conditions. Um, so that's pretty exciting. So I simulated the basically the observed point spread functions for um, so I took the observed point spread function from the current measurements from uh, Keck, and then used the, the simulated PSFs for Kappa and for uh, NFIRAWAS. So um, these, you know, these are um, given uh, a, an assumption of uh, strail of um, somewhere between, um, you know, it's variable I could tune it in analysis, but these ones are done for like 0 0.5. Um, and then I took four, uh, three different uh, quad lens systems that are also observed nowadays, and I simulated their um, appearance as they would look like to the system with uh, the given PSFs. So on the, on the left here we have um, basically the effect of the point, point spread function and then the addition of the noise. And this is uh, 
what the images are flashing are the, the subsequent improvements as the instruments are getting commissioned. Basically, first the um, new adaptive, adaptive optics systems and the detector at Keck, and then finally the TMT. So after I simulated the images, what I did is I tried to actually um, model the um, photometry and astrometry that will come out of these systems. So uh, in that model, one wants to reconstruct the PSFs and the noise, um, and then also infer the astrometric positions, and uh, we included the galaxy profile as well, and reconstructed the photometry. So uh, these are uh, the posteriors and the photometry from the, um, from the resulting measurements, and uh, this is a comparison between uh, the different stages of the experiments. And um, what's very helpful here is that we can um, actually tie these uh, flux ratios to what we hope would be inference on the um, halo mass functions themselves. So I really liked Ting's question earlier this week when she said, you know, it would be really good if we could uh, perform forecasting for our analysis. Um, so that's, that's basically what we try to do with this, uh, with this work. So um, this is a paper from uh, Daniel as well from 2019 when he was um, calculating the improvements on the half mode uh, mass um, based on the flux uncertainties and the number of lenses. So in this um, work, what we saw was that the flux ratio uncertainties are actually going to be um, below um, 2%. So we're actually going to go under this prediction, which was stopping here at 2% um, and at 10 to the power of 7 um, solar masses. So it's, it's, it's worth it right now to basically try to simulate this to even lower halos to see uh, where we are. So um, these were the precision um, in, in um, milliard seconds for the uh, astrometry. So we see that we basically go to sub milliard second precision on the location. And uh, for the flux ratios, depending on the system, we go from under 2% to um, under 0.5%, depending on whether or not the, we assume the point space function is known. So the, these new systems are, hoping, are going to have PSF inference built into the system. So it's, uh, we'll see how well that works. Um, and whether or not there's a galaxy present in terms of the light profile, because some quads have galaxies, some do not. So uh, overall, this is uh, sort of very um, well, you know, time, 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 good time to do this sort of work, um, because uh, Euclid and um, Rubin are basically going to ensure a movement of numbers to, to hundreds, if not thousands, and then uh, we'll be able to do very precise uh, measurements. And the, the important aspect of this um, very short, uh, small precisions um, are, is that we can basically decrease the exposure time. Like right now, we expose an uh, object to about 10 minutes. But with a new uh, system, we, we will be able to get them in about one minute. So it makes follow-up of 1,000 systems actually realistic. Uh, and also just wanted to mention that SNOMAS identifies the physical probes of dark matter as high priority research. So it's good. Um, so what does the future bring? Pretty much awesomeness, <laughs> amazingness. Um, and then just uh, wanted to give a shout out that I think forecasting results actually help motivate funding. Um, so please do uh, follow what Ting was saying to try to uh, basically get as much uh, um, literature out there in terms of what these future systems are, as are, good, at, at, are good at because we're facing you know, very high um, pressure on funding from all kinds of different uh, sources. So next steps in the work, uh, we saw that New digital state data is already out there um, from uh, Anna's and uh, Ryan's papers. Um, and extended source modeling has become uh, a thing, basically. And um, we're working right now on basically quantifying the impact of the assumptions that are baked into the recipes that we're using so that we can see what the error bars are. And uh, one of the problems I'm working on right now is trying to, quant trying to uh, group together different dark matter models into categories so that we can eliminate them all at once. 
um, because we don't want to keep having papers that are like, oh, I'm constrained from neutrinos again and again and again, <laughs> like, you know, and I'm doing the warm dark matter and I'm doing this. Um, so, like, hopefully we can just sort of um, map all of these guys into individual categories. Um, so I was working on this with my undergrad student, Yishin Chen. Um, she was working on basically ca categorizing if there's a ratio between halo mass function and subhalo mass functions across the different models. And I'm running out of time, so I don't have a lot of time to map here, but basically she identified um, flexible, basically analytical model that was capturing these dark matter models, and we were looking at mapping them to subhalos as well with um, the help of Shalong. And um, these are my collaborators, and I'm so thankful to have learned so much from them. Um, thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to put out there a question, I guess, for the questions <laughs> right now, but to you. Um, I think it would be amazing if we would be able to build as a community a, basically a publicly available pipeline of actually bringing together the different sources that are constraining the same regime of dark matter. So we have um, the quadrants and the Lima and Alpha Forest and the satellite system and the stellar streams are all kind of coming together to the same uh, observable constraint. So um, right now I feel like the papers are a bit separate where we are like individually publishing our results and trying to see if we can make joint analysis, but if we could make something where we're all adding to a pool of already existing posteriors so we can have like a joint posterior, that would be really cool. And similarly for basically having an inference pipeline for all dark matter classes at the same time. Yeah, thank you so much.